All right, so good morning and we're going to kick off this webinar today. Welcome to the Virtual Science Dialogue on Fusion. My name is Katie Hudak and I am part of the Office of Science and Technology Cooperation at the U.S. Department of State. My office leads in promoting international science and technology cooperation, and it is our mission and belief that great things happen when nations cooperate on science and technology. Before we start, I'd like to give a quick overview of today's agenda. Today's program consists of four guest speaker presentations broken into three topic sessions. These three sections will focus on science and technology challenges, industry perspectives on fusion energy, and building enabling environments. Our program length is 1.5 hours and concludes at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. There is a moderated Q&A chat where you can ask questions and discussion comments throughout the dialogue. We have an esteemed group of speakers today. Dr. Steffi Dean, U.S. Science Envoy and Fusion Scientist, Dr. Jean-Paul Alain, Associate Director for Fusion Energy Sciences at the Department of Energy, Dr. Scott Shu, Senior Advisor and Lead Fusion Coordinator, also at the Department of Energy, and Mr. Andrew Holland, Chief Executive Officer of the Fusion Industry Association. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Dean to provide brief opening remarks. Thank you, Steffi. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, fusion energy is a part of a solution set to a shared challenge of climate change, and the time is really ripe to build on years of technological advancements and also scientific investment in the field. And indeed, the United States sees fusion as a part of its broader goal to develop clean energy solutions. The Bold Decadal Vision, which was launched in 2022, underscores the importance that the United States places on fusion energy. Building on the Bold Decadal Vision, the United States announced international partnerships in a new era of fusion energy development last year, which really underscores the importance of international collaboration to advance the broader goals to realize fusion energy as a viable energy source. Today's dialogue convenes experts across the US fusion ecosystem to share their insights about what we need to do now to realize a fusion powered future, which is navigating the science and technology challenges that remain harnessing the rapidly increasing private sector activity and creating a broader environment for fusion to really grow and flourish. Importantly, today's speakers will highlight how international collaboration plays an important role in advancing each of these. To all the attendees today, your presence here today really underscores the increasing interest in fusion energy, which is really exciting to me and all of our speakers. Thank you so much for your interest, and I hope you leave today's dialogue aware of the work that we need to do and are also inspired that together we can realize Fusion's promise. The first dialogue highlights the science and technology challenges. And before I turn the dialogue over to our first presenter, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of fusion energy. So fusion occurs when two nuclei combine to form a heavier one, and that releases massive amounts of energy in the process. Our sun and all the stars in the night sky run on fusion energy. Everything that we know today was created by fusion. Fusion energy is fundamental to our universe and potentially fundamental to our, our future. Fusion uses a combination of lithium and hydrogen for fuel and releases 4 million times more energy than burning equal amounts of oil, coal, or gas. Fusion energy has great potential as a safe, abundant, zero carbon source of electricity and does not create long lived radioactive waste. Fusion also has the potential to provide a source of thermal energy and power for hydrogen production, industrial heat, carbon capture, and desalination. Fusion truly is engineering at the extremes. We need meet, uh, matter at extreme temperatures and pressures to get these nuclei to fuse together. And at these conditions, matter is in the plasma state, which is kind of like a soup of electrically charged particles. And we have to be very clever and build clever devices to create these conditions for fusion. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jean-Paul Alain from the Department of Energy to begin today's first presentation on the science and technology challenges. Great, thank you, Steffi, and uh, appreciate everybody's taking the time to, to join us here. Um, and as Steffi mentioned, you know, fusion and fusion reactions are um, a very unique, right? And they generate um, enormous amounts of power that we're trying to harness and translate that power into energy. 
that's ultimately our goal. But with that, you know, we have some tremendous challenges that we have to address. And so I'd like to just give a very brief um, overview of what some of these, um, you know, overriding challenges are. And so hopefully you could all see the slides here. All right. So first of all, um, you know, when we look, for example, at, you know, where we're at with Fusion, um, you know, for decades now, we've been investing significant amounts of of funding towards uh, the science and the how to do, in fact, of, um, of fusion energy and fusion um, reactions and the control thereof of those reactions. And a lot of that know-how and knowledge has been, in fact, over the years, maturing to a level that's providing us confidence, not just in the public sector, but especially in the private sector for us to now start investing in the kinds of things that we need to think about as we move and transition from a focus on science to a focus on eventually the commercialization of fusion energy. And part of that transition has a lot to do with addressing gaps that are defined around, uh, you know, how do you go about being able to not just uh, create the reaction and understand the reaction uh, in a fusion uh, system, but also be able to control it reliably, control it over a reliable amount of time with high enough power and density and at temperatures where you're able then to, to reach ultimately uh, what we're all after, which is fusion uh, gain. But in being able to do that, you'll see here on the left, I'm showing a number of technologies that still need to be de-risked. And although we've made tremendous progress around uh, most of these uh, technological areas, uh, there still remain some gaps. And right now we're in a place where the remaining science gaps and technology gaps need to be addressed hand in hand. So working in parallel with the way the industry is working on these and being able to address. So as you see here, uh, the uh, one of the gaps is fusion materials. You know, how do you, you know, survive, have materials survive the conditions, extreme conditions in these fusion energy systems? There's also, of course, the question of fuel. How do you fuel the device? How do you fuel the system and do it in a way that's reliable, that's safe, that's, of course, um, you know, you're able to manage the amount of fuel, in this particular case, tritium. So in some of the approaches that we have in, in our community, we're thinking of fuels like deuterium and tritium. How do you uh, not just harness the power of those reactions, but able to manage tritium itself? And of course, there's a lot of enabling technology, which means, you know, there are the, of course, the magnets to be able to contain, sustain the reactions. If you're, you, if your approach is using magnets, if you're using laser systems, of course, the laser systems have to be designed and, and maintained and, and sustained, of course, the conditions of eventually a fusion energy system that, that has uh, extraction of power. And then how do you integrate all these components together? And ultimately, you have to also sustain the uh, the burning plasma condition. That is, en enabling not just for you to harness those alpha particles that are burning, uh, but of course, as we all know, there's a lot of neutrons that are generated here that impact all these different areas. So, you know, these challenges of care ultimately are uh, integrated in what we would define as a fusion power plant system. In this case, I'm just showing you, in this case, a magnetic base system, but we have many other approaches, right? So uh, anywhere from magnetic confinement, you know, inertial system based on either magnets or laser systems, all of these um, uh, systems have technology gaps that we have to address, and they're very significant. And so establishing not just the foundational understanding of these, but then working our way from that basic understanding towards a practical understanding that's where we're at today. And we need to be very aggressive in terms of being able to invest against these challenges and these gaps. Um, I've mentioned this at other times that it really does require a different mindset in terms of how we think about fusion, because it's not sufficient for us just to think about fusion as a science, perhaps a science activity, but more importantly, how to tie that understanding, scientific understanding to that practical application uh, towards uh, fusion uh, energy. So you probably, most of you hopefully uh, were able to uh, participate in our White House Bold Decadal Vision event uh, last month, and we released two documents that you should take a look 
that really outlines our vision and strategy moving forward and um, and does outline, of course, and, and references a lot of our community's efforts in defining what these scientific and technological challenges are. And then finally, just recognizing that when it comes to the international platform, right, in terms of us uh, communicating fusion energy to the world, let's recognize also that fusion, which is generated by these in incredible plasma states that Steph alluded to earlier, that there's many applications and offshoots from um, working in fusion energy, for example, using plasmas for medicine, using plasmas in agriculture. And there's a tremendous opportunity for us uh, to communicate that message to the rest of the world. So we'll talk more about that in our discussions and our Q&A. And at this point, I'll go ahead and pass it back to, to Steffi. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this overview. And as a reminder, you can use the uh, the function to submit questions. So I'll be alternating between questions that were submitted ahead of time and also questions in the chat. So uh, JP, thank you so much for that overview of the science and technology challenges. I was wondering if you can go into a little bit of uh, what the role of international collaboration is for this, achieve, to, to tackle these challenges. And also, if you could talk a little bit about how fusion energy can be a viable alternative for energy sources in developing countries. Yeah, thanks, Steffi. It's a great question. So there's, you know, we we've been we've benefited from many decades of international collaboration, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of investment towards the understanding of the science of fusion, and and certainly those activities have um, been uh, quite prolific in terms of you know, generating knowledge, understanding, um, and beyond that understanding, um, what is also have has done is establish a communities and, and ecosystems, if you will, around doing fusion. For example, a lot of our scientists that are developing a lot of the advanced models that, you know, are all validated uh, in a lot of these experimental fusion platforms around the world also make use of advanced diagnostics, right? That we're utilizing to be able to validate those codes. And those two approaches, those tools, if you will, both the diagnostics and the modeling are enabling us to take that understanding to that next level for us to be able to close those technology gaps. So the international collaboration around that has created an ecosystem for us to now leverage to be able to take that next level and that next step. I think around the world, you know, all of us have recognized what are some of the key gaps, uh, you know, as I mentioned, materials, the fuel cycle, blanket technology. Um, and a lot of that technology, as a matter of fact, is being addressed in, in very large projects that we're working collaboratively. ITER, of course, is one example of that, you know, where we look at the supply chain impact of developing, for instance, the management of tritium systems and the management of materials you know, development of those materials for those extreme conditions expected in that platform. So I think this is just the beginning. I think we're going to see a lot more participation from not just the uh, major players that have been around in terms of just traditional funding, but I think we're seeing some new um, performers coming out around the world, around the globe, that are very interested in engaging with us. And there's a place, um, not just for those who would have traditional programs in fusion science and, and engineering, but also now folks that are really thinking beyond the science to think about adoption of this energy source. So for example, in the social sciences, folks that are around, you know, really thinking about the techno-economic, socioeconomic impacts of adoption of, of fusion. Um, there's a lot of talent out there around the globe. And I think you mentioned developing countries, you know, I'm you know, originally from Colombia. So, you know, certainly understand the need for an energy source like this. So, yeah, I think that there's um, opportunities for countries to be engaged. I think the one challenge that, you know, we haven't uh, focused as much is the one on workforce development. This is a significant challenge. In fact, it's one that I have noted in my vision for FES. Um, and I, I've noted it as a primary uh, focus for that vision because it's extremely important to understand that it's not just a shortage of talent in fusion, it's a shortage of talent in STEM and a shortage of talent in higher education and 
and even not just higher education in the trade. So we're seeing a shortage of both technology leading practice and also advanced uh, scientific and technological um, uh, expertise that we're falling short on. And I think that this is where uh, both the global South working and collaborating very closely with major players in fusion can, can play a huge role. There's tremendous talent out of many nations um, in this part of the world that we should uh, certainly pay attention to and create some bridges to the programs that we have in-house. Yeah, thank you so much. You're bringing up a lot of great points. And I think I was really excited along with a lot of other people in Fusion on the announcement of the International Strategic um, Pillars of Engagement, which really helps to build those bridges to accelerate the tackling of those challenges. And then along with that, the fact that um, Fusion Energy could really provide a way to um, provide base load, reliable base load electricity to developing countries and then building those partnerships and reaching out to STEM adjacent fields is it's key in that. So thank you. I'm gonna now jump to a couple of questions that we have in the chat. So thanks for people submitting them. So the first one is, has uh, the Office of Fusion Energy Sciences looked at the dual uses of these fusion technologies for the defense community? Superconducting magnets and wire, high voltage um, electronics, optics for lasers and laser diodes all seem like exciting areas for dual use. They are exciting. And, and certainly these are areas that not just impact advanced technology in the, in the areas mentioned here in the question, but also our supply chain. And, and that's certainly an area that we would like to see uh, support of, you know, in, in, in looking at how they also tie in, for instance, to some of our fusion developers around the country. Uh, there's so a number of companies that are looking at, uh, you know, advanced power electronics, advanced, you know, uh, superconducting man magnet technology. Um, all of those technologies are ones that, you know, we're hoping to see not just funded through our milestone program, but some of the new public private partnership initiatives that we have in the program. Traditionally, we have not, in fact, uh, uh, supported these areas as much as we should. And I think this is an area of opportunity for us in the office. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to another one. I, I'll actually do a quick answer to this one. Um, the question is, there's, is there anywhere in the world where fusion energy is being deployed? So I'm gonna answer this in the context of what fusion neutrons are doing for society already. And that's um, a company that I know is near me, uh, Shine Medical, is using fusion neutrons to uh, make short-lived medical isotopes to diagnose and treat cancer. Um, and then I'll turn it over to JP for other uses of, of fusion or benefits to society already from fusion research. Yeah, and I think I alluded to a little bit on the sort of um, offshoots that, you know, fusion can have. So, of course, uh, you know, fusion energy in, in, in general will have a tremendous impact on baseload, as Steffi mentioned. But there are also some offshoot applications. So, uh, the use of plasmas and our understanding of them, plasma technology is a big area. Plasma medicine, for example, is a big uh, area that's growing. For example, the treatment of skin with the use of atmospheric plasmas, uh, the use of plasmas in agriculture in terms of uh, you know impacting yield by treatment of the soil with atmospheric plasmas are a few examples of offshoots that come out of the work around fusion energy. So I think this is just uh, the beginning really of understanding the impact that the whole industry is gonna have overall. Um, how do you balance building U.S. capabilities and assets within a constrained budget environment, realizing the bold decadal vision? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Very and also, and also, I do want to add in, in, in the, the capability to leverage international capabilities as assets yeah. to this too. Yeah, no, this is a great question. And it's something obviously that, you know, we've communicated through uh, various, you know, platforms about how we're thinking about this, we're, we're developing a fusion science and technology roadmap precisely to be able to prioritize and 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 really balance uh, a lot of the priorities we have in the program. Um, change is difficult. It's not it's not easy for you to chart a new direction uh, without understanding the implications of how you need to be able to 
really take that ecosystem, the fusion ecosystem we've built for decades to be able to really get us uh, on traction towards addressing the gaps that we talked about earlier. But international collaborations become vital for this because again, it's, it's, it's really important to understand um, a lot of industries that have been very successful in being able to translate hard technology have done so with international collaboration. Semiconductor re research and semiconductor, the semiconductor industry is a great example of this, where globally, you know, a lot of the uh, major players came together to, to collaborate and, and work together towards being able to translate some of this technology. I think Fusion has that sort of, um, that same situation right now in terms of being able to leverage international collaboration. I would say an example is being able to partner with like-minded nations on uh, strategic facilities, uh, be it uh, you know fuel cycle, blanket technology, materials, irradiation testing. Those are, those are uh, gaps we have right now that we can emphasize and we can work with partners around the world to, to get to, to realize. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna answer this one and you can jump in too. So how can we transform this knowledge to our students as we are facing the great challenges of ecosystem and climate change too? Uh, so I do a lot of public engagement, reaching out to schools, um, having these two-way dialogues about what fusion can mean for society and how it, it, it could impact people. And people come to me and they're like, well, I'm really interested in um, AI machine learning. I really love uh, welding. I'm excellent at that. How can I fit into fusion? And there's actually a lot of diverse skill sets that's needed to tackle these engineering challenges. And so bringing people into our ecosystem, like you mentioned, JP, is key because there's a lot that people can help to accelerate and advance fusion energy. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, too. I, think, I think absolutely. Yeah. I think again, the trades, the technology trades, you know, welding, metallurgical engineering. I mean, these are areas that are so vital and central to the next level of work that we need in fusion. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, building on this kind of workforce, there's a, a question. Can you comment on how the U.S. government um, DOE considers partnerships that build international workforce capabilities and doesn't just leverage? Smaller economies typically are concerned with their that their own talent will be attracted and retained by the U.S., potentially hollowing out smaller economies working uh, to develop and retain their own talent. How is the U.S. government sensitive to this concern from international partners? That, that's a great question. And, and, you know, we're developing our fusion workforce program right now in FES, and, and this is definitely a, a discussion we're having. Um, and of course, with my prior experience in academia, both as professor and department head, uh, this is always uh, a, a sensitive point. What you want to create are partnerships, and partnerships takes two sides, equal sides that bring in strengths from both sides. And it's not a point of, of leveraging because we're trying to just to gain in one direction. That's not the point. In fact, the vision is really to understand where are the strengths at other parts of the world and how do they make us, in fact, larger and, and, and more enriched, if you will, by that relationship and partnership. That's really the point is that we're trying to look for uh, ways that are win-win but even where the you know the uh, parts and their sum are, are much bigger than the parts themselves, and so I think in the program we're going to look for opportunities where faculty can engage with other faculty and other universities around the world that they can you know we can understand what program programmatically we can support uh, infrastructure is another big one where locally at places around the world there could be those nuclei of folks that the cha they champion and educate uh, folks around fusion energy. That's one example, but there are many others that we can uh, really understand how we can have win-win um, examples, right? That the program can support. Yeah, I love that. It's, it's equitable partnerships. It's helping to build capacity in nations. Um, and then uh, the last question for this section, um, the the Fusion Office of Fusion Energy Sciences mission has expanded to include supporting the development of an industry. How do you reconcile this new element with the core mission of FES basic science and research? They appear to be fundamentally different. 
Well, I will always remind folks that, you know, um, what we do in FAS is not just purely science, uh, basic science, that we are, in fact, uh, working on a lot of enabling technologies, enabling sciences work, uh, both in our uh, base program and also in the new initiatives that are coming out. Uh, the Fire Collaborative is an example that I've talked about uh, recently, where we're going to tie in a lot of the, you know, activities and in industry back to our base program. But you got to remember that there's a lot of things that we're doing in the base program, too, that are, in fact, from decades of work around science that are now uh, beginning to align and, and now beginning to uh, pivot towards questions, fundamental questions around the technology readiness of a lot of the gaps that we talked about. Uh, we, we can't just imagine a new material for fusion or imagine a new blanket for fusion. These are, these are technologies that are at very low TRL. So there are still some foundational questions around them. Uh, there's another question around what neutrons do, how to manage neutrons uh, in these extreme reactions. Those are foundational questions. And we intend to have our program uh, focus more and more on those questions. In fact, there's a lot of discussion about this. And I'll also remind folks, you know, lithium technology was unheard of in fusion back in the you know, early 90s when I joined the program, except for a few papers that folk, you know, people thought about sort of you know, second thought. Um, the US has led in lithium fusion technology for over two decades. This program has funded it, not at the levels that we should, but certainly funded it. And we intend to see technologies like this continue to grow in our program. Yeah, I think that was one of the reasons I was drawn to fusion actually is that coupling of understanding deep foundational um, plasma science with that application to impact society that in, in bridge, multitude right? of ways. I mean, that bridge yeah. is so important. Uh, and I think that's what we should focus on is that bridge, how to connect that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for this section. And we're going to have a big panel Q&A at the end too. Um, so for now, uh, thank you, JP. And we'll come back to you towards the end. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Holland to talk about the industry perspectives on fusion energy. Steffi, great. Thank you. Uh, great to be with you all. It looks like there's a, a great group already here online. Uh, so look forward to taking some questions after I give my, my brief overview here of um, what's happening in the private fusion industry and, and where everything's going. So let me start by sharing my screen here. It looks like that's working. Uh, so thanks all for being with me. Um, just to, to kind of level set and give everybody an idea on, on where the private fusion energy industry is. Uh, and I, I'll start by noting that these numbers are from last year's FIA report on the private fusion energy industry. And keep an eye out because next week we will be uh, launching our 2024 report. So we'll have updated numbers for you soon. Um, but the trend lines uh, I can report are, are much the same. Uh, so where are we today? There are at least 43 companies around the world with over $6.2 billion invested in them. These companies are optimistic about the time scales that they'll be able to bring fusion energy to the grid. Um, these companies uh, have seen growing interest from governments in building public-private partnerships, both here in the United States and around the world. There is a growing geographic diversity in there. And of course, these companies understand that many challenges remain on the pathway to fusion energy. Those, uh, those technological challenges that JP addressed in the start are real. And I don't want uh, people watching this to think that the industry is somehow some sort of Pollyanna and is just saying it's all for the best and, and there's, there's no challenges and it's not hard. Fusion is hard. Uh, the company growth, as you can see, we've had this really uh, very significant, almost Cambrian explosion of different technologies and different private companies in the last five years or so come onto the scene and then start to raise money. You can see going back over 25 years, there was uh, several, but then it grew very quickly in that 2018, 2019 timeframe. Uh, and uh, 
the, if you look at the, the companies and where they're from, this is, in fact, the truth is, it is largely an American industry at this point. Of those 43 companies, 25 are American, and about 80% of the, the investment that has gone into private industry around the world has gone into those American located companies. That said, there is a gl growing global diversity in the fusion energy industry uh, with 12 countries that have at least one fusion company. And uh, in, in the last couple of years, we've seen new ones come on the scene in places like Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and uh, especially China. But we always have to remember that fusion is fundamentally global, has been since 1958, when at the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to cooperate on scientific endeavors in fusion energy. And uh, there's global scientific leadership, global scientific cooperation. It's a global workforce, and the supply chain is largely global as well. So why is this happened now? I always get get asked, well, what what happened? What changed? What was the thing that that got this over? And like everything, it's never just one thing. It's never just one, but it's a combination of things. and and they they kind of fall onto two sides. One is supply side, you know, and the other is demand side. And so on supply side, what what I can say is that fusion is ready. Today's scientific and technological advances enable breakthroughs. And by that, I mean things like new materials, high-speed computing, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, advanced manufacturing. You take those from outside of the fusion uh, space and you apply them to the greater scientific understanding of plasma physics using new business models, the private sector approach, the venture capital approach to fusion energy has really enabled us to accelerate and bring this forward. And when I say the greater scientific understanding of, of plasma physics, I want to highlight this graph put together by our, our upcoming speaker, Scott Shu and his colleague, Sam Wurzel, uh, a couple of years ago that shows the historical uh, pro pro progress towards break-even fusion. And you can see this in multiple different technological fields and multiple different uh, approaches. And so, so it's along this pathway, along this line. Basically, the private sector companies are you know, running the last leg of a relay race, but that relay race has been ongoing for a long time as you know, university scientists, national labs, uh, national programs have been building towards this moment for a long time. But then this is also a case of demand side. The truth is the world needs fusion. Uh, fusion is, is the ultimate climate solution. Uh, I, I really think that it's almost impossible for us to get to those net zero 2050 goals without a new source of zero emission firm power. Fusion meets that goal. Now, you can meet it in other ways as well, but but fusion is the one that has the least drawbacks, the ways, the ultimate way to get there. And also, fusion provides comprehensive energy security, and fusion is really the ultimate business opportunity and, and one of the last big business opportunities left. Uh, so that's why investors are piling in on this. So I, I mentioned that companies are increasingly confident. Uh, we continue to see this confidence that, that companies expect to see fusion energy on the grid, fusion electricity powering the grid somewhere in the world in uh, the 2030s or before, with the vast majority of them, as you can see here uh, on this graph, this top graph, showing that they expect to see it in the first half of the 2030s. Now, last I checked, it's the middle of the 2020s now. It's 2024. So that is a decadal time frame. And our, our companies expect to be able to meet that. And as you can see, the next graph shows the, the that they're confident that it will be um, commercially viable, not in the exact same time frame. It shifts a little bit to the right, but, but that this will be a commercially viable uh, approach to get there. And so that leads us to industry's timeline. We're right here now in, in the movement from the, the handoff from scientific uh, research into fusion energy to multiple companies right now building their scientific proof of concept machines in the United States and elsewhere around the world, such that when they prove 
that they are able to produce fusion energy in a commercial viable, commercially viable manner. They'll be able to quickly move in the late 2020s to designing and building the pilot plants so that they're able to operate by the early 2030s. And then that makes the decade of the 2030s the decade of scale up and moving into a commercially viable enterprise. Now, this is a worldwide effort. I, I alluded to this before. There is both competition and collaboration going on. And I, I listed some of the key countries here that are in the lead on this. I'm happy to go into that further in questions. But you know, when we talk about progress, we have seen real uh, active progress on the policies that will enable fusion. But I want to. I, I also want to underscore here. I'm not going to go through all of these, but these these are real active policies that will enable the commercial fusion energy industry, and we see more coming. But this is also not just companies building things on computer screens or on paper and and raising money based on that. They're building things. These are actual solid deep tech investments that are getting there and and you know building prototypes and moving on the pathway towards getting to commercially viable fusion so we expect to see this uh, move forward and we, we think the timelines are ambitious but also attainable and so with that Steffi I'm happy to take questions I'm happy to have a, a conversation with the rest of our panelists and uh, maybe I'll stop sharing here and and uh, look forward to talking to to our great uh, great group of uh, audience members and stuff like that. Okay, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, question: I'll start off the question. Um, so you mentioned an aggressive timeline, and then you also brought up several big challenges that the industry faces. Uh, can you talk a bit more about how we can leverage public private partnerships? to accelerate this path forward. Yeah, of course. And so what, what you have to do to be able to meet ambitious timelines is to be able to work on multiple things in parallel, right? You, you, ha you can't just wait for one thing to be complete and then move on to the next thing. So that means you have to leverage basically any partnerships you can do. Um, and we really see these new public-private partnerships coming into being. Here in the United States, the new milestone-based public-private partnership, in which DOE has selected eight companies, all members of the FIA, uh, who are building pilot plants. The, the initial stage of this, uh, this milestone-based approach is for getting to a comprehensive engineering design for a pilot plant. Um, and the really unique thing about this milestone-based approach that, that we really like is that it is a, a pay-for-performance um, approach. It is in something that is fundamentally uncertain at the very bleeding edge of, of science. Uh, it's appropriate for government to say, show us, right? You know, we're not sure if you can do this. So set out some bold milestones and then show us you can do it. And then we'll pay you after the fact, instead of traditional um, contract, government contracts or public, public private partnerships that are fixed cost targets or, or things like this. This is a fixed milestone target, and then you get you get reimbursed after the fact. So, so that's a good way to do it. Um, but, but yeah, we we're also leveraging programs like Infuse, which allows companies to work directly with national labs on individual problems, individual things that you know maybe there's only one person in in the world who works at a government funded university or national lab. Uh, and to be able to work with that person directly through a voucher from the DOE is, is really an important way to kind of de-risk your programs and, and move forward with these. Um, and then how can NGOs and CSOs and, and philanthropic partners support fusion energy development and deployment and work with the industry? Nice. Yeah, it, it's so important that that this is a really a whole of society approach to getting to fusion energy. We we can't just expect businesses to do it, just like we can't expect just governments to do it. We need uh, we need NGOs, we need uh, communities to get involved. And so so the, the the big question when I'm asked how, I say, well, how much? Um, because there's multiple different ways of of doing it at, at different amounts. You know, if you're thinking really bold, big scale philanthropic donors in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, 
there is real things that need to be built, the infrastructure, test stands and, and such like that of the fusion energy economy. So big philanthropists don't have to just think that that they can uh, just make investments. They can also help build things uh, in a philanthropic way. But then when you're scaling down to you know NGOs and such like that, um, what we really need to do is build out the excitement, the education about fusion uh, among the general public, among policymakers, among grassroots and grass tops to get people to start to understand fusion is coming, what concerns do they have about it, um, and then how to respond to those concerns. Because, you know, we, we've seen among the Fusion Industry Association member companies that are building things, they've been really successful in engaging with communities and, and building partnerships uh, and kind of responding to those concerns in communities. So we, we have experience in this, but it's at the very local level. And as we sort of scale up, we're going to have to get scaled up to the national level as well. So we need we need as many partners and and allies in this this endeavor as we can get. Yeah, you bring up a great point about now we're working locally and the need to expand nationally, but also globally and to reach the different communities that are going to be impacted by the whole of fusion, right? The entire life cycle from mining deployment to decommissioning. Um, and we can touch on that later today too. So I'm, I'm glad you started the conversation on the local level. Um, what is FIA doing to promote, promote international collaboration mm -hmm. and what else could you be doing and what constraints do you face? Um, well, first of all, what is the FIA doing to promote inter international collaboration? We we are fundamentally an international organization. Our members are are everywhere, and and we have a director based in the UK as well as a director based in Europe. We think that the uh, announced program from uh, DOE uh, at the COP last year on international collaboration is really an important way forward, and uh, and we need to to find ways. Um, like JP said in his previous talk about um, burden sharing among like-minded countries and finding ways to to share science and and share you know these these test stands and and such like that. So so the FIA really supports those and and pushes that forward. You know the other thing I, I like to think that we're trying to do is to almost push back against some of this effort. You know that. There's always, especially in you know, the 2020s right now, we're we're seeing this global backlash to um, globalization, really, uh, and you know, countries want to build more in their own countries, and that's appropriate, and and you know that that's fine to to see that happen, um, but it shouldn't be about putting barriers up to trade and barriers up to cross-border investments, knowledge sharing, that sort of stuff. It should be about racing faster and, you know, encouraging your companies to be able to move faster and, and grow faster. And so, um, you know, we, 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 we've been trying to push back against some of these barriers that have, have uh, been contemplated. We don't see too many of them now, but there's certainly a, a, an effort uh, that could happen in that. Great, thank you so much for kind of putting that all in perspective. Um, and what are some of the core tensions, healthy or otherwise, between the public and private sectors? Yeah, core tensions are, are start with intellect, intellectual property. You know, who owns intellectual property? How do they go there? Uh, who uh, who gets it? That those sorts of things. And um, so, you know, we we fundamentally uh, as scientific organizations think that the things, the, the intellectual property you develop are at their core, the, the things that that you will need to, to provide value to your company. Um, you know, sometimes we see actors within governments saying that, that, you know, intellectual property needs to be retained by the government. And, you know, to, to the answer, the, the question is, you know, for what, what end? You know what what we're looking for here is to have a thriving fusion energy industry uh, 
Uh, and how do you do that? How do you help develop that? Well, you make sure that the investors who are inve investing in that that industry feel confident that the things that are developed by the countries are, are there. The other thing I'd say that we sometimes see as as conflict is is more rhetorical. Um, you know, sometimes people think, and we've seen it in the media probably more than we've seen it elsewhere, that that there's this race between the public sector and the private sector. Um, and that's they private companies don't see it that way. They don't see it as, you know, we need to get there before, you know, some of these publicly funded programs do or anything like that. The, the, the truth is, is that the companies are the ones that ultimately this has to be a commercial endeavor. So, you know, if the companies are stepping forward to do this and get there. Well, then, you know, government should be should be there to help build the infrastructure and, and such there. But, you know, when when JP was saying earlier that it it's hard to change um, embedded um, ideas and and such like that, that's that's kind of what it goes down to is there's there's been a lot of assumptions for 40, 50 years in the fusion program. Uh, and here comes the private sector companies. They're challenging some of those assumptions. And sometimes that is a, a bit of a challenge. Well, thank you. And I'm actually gonna invite the other panelists on because there's a couple of questions that really tackle a lot of what you've been talking about, the public private, you know, working together ecosystem. And I see JP, you marked that you were gonna answer one of these questions live about the DOESBIR <laughs> topics. Would you like to do that? Now? Yeah, yeah, and before I do okay. that, you know, let me just address a point that yeah. that Andrew made that I think is really important for us to realize is, you know, I always talk about these this point about converging public and private interest, and what that means is that convergence is really to again one is the mindset in terms of how we do fusion, but the other one, and it's not just the private sector, but in fact, there are members in our community pushing for this, for us to make sure that what we're working on building the infrastructure, the investments, they're all putting us on traction to ensure ultimately that we're getting to fusion energy and to realize fusion energy. That's why we're in this in the first place, right? It's, in fact, is what got me excited about fusion energy back in the 90s, right? And so we wanted to get there, but I think it's important. We are living a very different moment in fusion. It's not the same moment a decade ago or two decades ago. And that mindset has to change now. We can't wait until, like Andrew mentioned, until we figure out the one thing or other thing that we need to understand. No, it has to, our attitude has to change and say, look, the urgency is for us to do this right now. And of course, in the international context, there is a race that we need to be aware of. And we need to make sure that we're on top of that. The only way, uh, the only comment I want to mention on the uh, chat question related to SBIR, not that we're talking about, you know, different priorities is, you know, we have approaches with MFE and IFE, with IFE and manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, that's an area that's only going to grow. And that will be coming in the near future. And I just want to make sure folks understand, you know, our programs are slated and defined a certain way, but we're not just pivoting just to pivot we're really trying to define these pathways to ensure the bridge between industry and the public sector makes sense so that these investments are leveraged in the best way possible okay i'm going to jump to uh andrew do you want to add to that or no i i, I okay. agree okay um so there was an announcement last week about eater and the updated timeline and so I'd like you all to comment on um, kind of how ITER and the international community and, and our efforts kind of work with that. Thanks for not pulling any punches there, Stephanie. Uh... You know, <laughs> thanks to the chat. <laughs> we have um, great questions from the audience. Uh, I'll, I'll report that uh, FIA and, and um, a number of our companies participated in a really important private-public partnership at Eater, uh, new, uh, it was a workshop for the first time ever at the end of May where they invited, uh, there was over 30 private companies came and talked about 
um, how they can work with Eater, what we're looking for from Eater, and how Eater can better position itself to be a center for knowledge sharing around fusion and not just something that is building a big, important science experiment, but also a real, the, the Eater organization can become a, a way to help you know, build fusion into the future. Um, if they follow up on these, if we are able to get both the knowledge sharing and the public-private partnerships and such with uh, with Eater, it could develop into a more than just you know a a single big um, experiment and into something that really helps enable the global fusion energy effort around the world. Um, we'd like to see that develop. We'd like to see that that go forward. Yeah, and if I, I can expand on that too, I mean, I think that, you know, the impact of uh, this project that has had on the supply chain and some of the technologies that are being developed is really important to recognize that that's an impact to the whole ecosystem. And we need to understand how best leverage that. And to Andrew's point, you know, we need to put our minds together, our thought together. And again, how do we converge those interests, make sure that we're making, taking full advantage of the investments there with Eater. Uh, in fact, Scott and I have been talking quite a bit about this in terms of, and I think Scott, you were at this, this event as well in the end of May, how to take advantage of making sure that that know-how knowledge and, and expertise is translated over to the private sector in effective ways, right? It's not just a translation of knowledge, but there has to be an effective impact in what we're trying to do in the private sector. Yeah, if I may, I, I just want to really emphasize, you know, I was there personally, as JP just mentioned, uh, I think it's essential that we translate that accumulated knowledge from Eater uh, to the private industry, even though, of course, the private industry is pursuing different fusion designs, the choices and trade-offs, uh, design trade-offs that Eater has made, um, there's just tremendous embedded knowledge uh, in those decisions uh, in, and in their supply chains, as JP mentioned. Thanks. Okay, thank you all. I think for right now, we're going to pass it over to Scott to talk about building enabling environments. And then I'm going to invite you all back because we still have a lot of questions. So thank you. I'll turn it over to you now, Scott. Okay, great. Let me try to find uh, how to share my slides here. Hold on just a second. I'm not seeing it. Okay, does that look okay to everyone? We got it. Yep. Okay, thank you. And so what I thought I would do here is um, give a very brief summary of this Fusion Energy Strategy 2024 that was announced last month. Um, kind of, uh, you know, everything in the strategy really is about providing the right enabling environment as we move, uh, you know, ahead uh, with a focus on uh, timely fusion commercialization. Um, so uh, this this fusion energy strategy was announced at this White House event uh, last month, marking two years of the U.S. bold decadal vision for commercial fusion energy. Uh, and there are links here um, if these slides are uh, eventually shared for folks who would like to do some more uh, reading. And the strategy is organized uh, around uh, three pillars uh, in support of the U.S. bold decadal vision. And, and maybe let me just quickly remind folks that the, the bold decadal vision uh, really is about um, uh, taking advantage of pr public-private partnerships to accelerate uh, the R&D uh, toward enabling a fusion pilot plant uh, on a rather aggressive time scale. Um, and so the goal uh, is, in fact, to close the science and technology gaps two uh, viable fusion pilot plant designs here uh, over the rest of this decade um, so that we could be in a position to build and operate fusion pilot plants in the 2030s. Uh, but given this aggressive timeline, um, and, and we want fusion energy to have impact uh, on energy markets uh, globally uh, by mid-century, and so you need to really work in parallel uh, to prepare that path to commercial deployment 
And so there's a number of activities that you may not otherwise uh, uh, pay very close attention to, um, except uh, that we want to enable the commercial environment for fusion deployment on that same time scale. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention some of those uh, areas that we're starting to address. And then finally, uh, which really is a theme of this event, is to build and leverage external partnerships broadly in support of both of those first two pillars, uh, and, and in particular, in international partnerships. I would also just mention the caveat. Um, you know, what the timeline shown here, of course, is, is aspirational. Um, it's dependent. Uh, on the level of public and private investments that are brought to bear. It's dependent on, uh, you know, the innovations um, that we're able to achieve. And that's why the enabling environment is so important. So pillar one uh, of the strategy is, is very much coordinated uh, with the new uh, Fusion Energy Sciences program uh, vision from JP entitled Building Bridges. Uh, he alluded uh, to this a bit earlier. Um, but I just wanted to quickly summarize that kind of the, the near-term focus um, in launching uh, this Building Bridges vision to tackle the remaining science and technology challenges. Firstly, uh, JP's program office is, is developing a national fusion science and technology roadmap um, that's rather unique because it's aligned uh, with the needs of industry. Um, and so this roadmap is going to focus on the how and when of closing these science and technology gaps two industry-led and government-enabled fusion pilot plants. Secondly, uh, in fact, I believe the pre-applications are due today. Um, the Fire Innovation Research Engine Collaboratives uh, are a new program uh, in the Fusion Energy Sciences program that aim to bridge the foundational science and technology research that FES has supported for many decades um, with the technology development needs of the U.S. fusion industry. Uh, and thirdly, there's a proposed public-private consortium framework, or PPCF, we call for short. And there's a request for information, uh, RFI, uh, uh, out right now. Um, and we envision that these uh, that, that this consortium framework will be anchored by regional hubs. Uh, and one reason for that is that we would really like to be able to catalyze state and local government private as well as philanthropic funding and partnerships uh, as we move into this era of fusion commercialization. Um, the initial goal of the PPCF is to deliver small to medium scale R&D test facilities uh, that have been identified in many recent um, uh, community reports uh, as being needed uh, to resolve the remaining science and technology gaps. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Pillar 2 is really focused on preparing that path to sustainable and equitable commercial fusion deployment. Um, this chart is showing that, you know, kind of in parallel with addressing, uh, closing the R&D gaps, um, we need to address a number of broader issues. Uh, in fact, you need to address these uh, issues for any uh, commercial energy technology deployment, not just fusion. But but you you know I won't read through all of them. Um, but these are are not going to be surprising to folks. Um, and this is also based on an adoption readiness level framework ARL developed by our DOE Office of Technology Transitions. Um, you know where they have thought very systematically um, if we need to meet these very uh, fast and aggressive timelines, uh, we want to be working in parallel to address uh, all of these. Uh, all of these issues, which could be potential barriers, right? Even even if the science and technology gaps are solved, uh, there's no assurance that you're going to deploy in the marketplace uh, unless you address all of these issues. And so DOE is in parallel uh, starting to address some of these things, many of which uh, do have long, uh, very long lead times. And then last but not least, uh, we realize... Um, you know, no single nation is is likely to ha probably have all the resources needed to uh, to bring fusion to global uh, deployment. And obviously, we want fusion to be globally deployed to to maximize its positive impacts. Um, and so, uh, these are broad partnerships with the U.S. government interagency, with the private sector, with academia, non governmental organizations, nonprofits, philanthropy, state local governments, and communities. Uh, but I and also international partnerships, which I, I want to highlight here in a bit more depth. 
Um, on the right hand side, you see a photo of um, uh, a, a former special presidential uh, envoy for climate, John Kerry, announcing the U.S. strategy on international partnerships and in a new era of fusion energy development. Um, and in parallel, uh, the United States has signed uh, uh, or has two joint statements announced uh, for strategic partnerships in fusion uh, with the U.K. and with Japan uh, and discussions are are proceeding uh, with others to come. Uh, but I really want to emphasize that the international partnerships is really meant to um, be very inclusive uh, in terms of global uh, partnerships and engagements. And, and, and secondly, it's really looking toward that eventual fusion deployment, not just solving the R&D challenges in partnerships, uh, uh, but growing markets and supply chains, uh, coordinating on regulatory frameworks, uh, global workforce development, public engagement and, and education. Hmm. And I want to especially point out that even for nations that may not have had a longstanding uh, fusion R&D programs, um, these pillars, which are needed for global fusion deployment, are also, uh, we believe, uh, very suitable for partnerships uh, with a range of nations and different levels of, of investments uh, in fusion. And so with that, I'll uh, conclude and look forward to the discussion and, and audience questions. Okay. Um, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can, but with, we'll see where we're at with time. So um, I'll start with what policies would you like to see to enable effective international collaborations? I know you mentioned some of the pillars of engagement, but, but are there details or things you'd like to add? Yeah, so you know, in a lot of cases, um, these do need to start with with rather organic interactions. Uh, you know, both at the government to government level, as well as uh, at the um, you know at the industry level, at the at the lab to lab and academia level. So I think we need all of that. But if, but in some cases, we do need government policies. Um, uh, you know, export control, for example, is is one area, and sharing of intellectual property, which was brought up earlier. Uh, and so I think those are the types of areas where um, governments especially are needed to, to be brought into the conversation to, you know, to try to make these interactions and partnerships more, more streamlined. Um, in many cases already, we see uh, individual institutions uh, partnering, and that's great, right? I mean, uh, we, we don't want to get in the way of that. Uh, we applaud those. Um, but I think in the cases where government interactions uh, are needed to streamline those, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, that's where we want to focus some effort on. Right. Um, how can industry and academia collaborate to address workforce needs for fusion? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm, I'm sure you have, uh, you'll want to address that as well. But from my perspective, and as we mentioned in the DOE fusion strategy document, you know, we're, we're moving, um, uh, in multiple directions uh, in terms of our need to expand our workforce efforts. You know, going beyond plasma science into multiple other disciplines is one uh, direction of expansion. But also another direction of expansion is, uh, you know, industry needs are rather different than university researcher needs, right? We have focused on um, training uh, future researchers uh, predominantly in fusion up to this point, but now we need a very broad range of, of skilled workers um, and, and even non-technical skilled workers uh, to support a fusion industry. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of great points for that. The uh, academic strength is really in training a robust workforce from doing that foundational research. So my, my group really works on like, how do you do innovative ways to uh, do plasma initiation? And then we also have the flexibility universities to address those broader challenges in fusion to support industry growth. So this is the intersection of society, technology, economics, and the environment. Um, we have a lot of experts in that area. And then we are seeing a lot of shift from historically, you know, PhD programs, now masters, and then also, um, you know, uh, targeting apprenticeship programs, looking at skilled workforce from like the people that are actually able to build and craft expert crafts people for these for these experiments. Um, one thing that we've also done is looking at STEM adjacent fields too. So an example being people who are really interested in getting into data science, 
um, and maybe applying that to fusion. And so we have uh, launched a summer school that really brings in people from the state data science um, sector, uh, undergrads, half of the, it's a two week summer school, half of the day they learn data science techniques and the other half of the day they learn about fusion and plasma science and how they can bring that expertise there. Um, I'm gonna go to another question um, for you, Scott. Inside the national laboratories, there indeed has been great tension between their traditional mission sets, for example, NNSA priorities and this new mission around fusion energy. It is generally hard to turn these large bureaucracies and organizations on a dime. We have seen scientists kind of, uh, you know, uh, be careful about navigating that energy mission because uh, lab directors or administrators may be cautious about embracing this new energy mission. Can you comment on how you're addressing this difference from where you're at in DOE? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Uh, you know, I myself come from an NSA laboratory, so so I, I understand this very uh, very directly. Um, I, I think from the DOE perspective right now, um, what we're doing, uh, we're kind of in a transitional phase, right, with fusion, as, as fusion has been a, a scientific uh, endeavor up to this point, and, and we do have science labs, uh, you know, kind of as distinct, differentiated from, from the NNSA labs. Um, and in this transition period, what we're trying to do is coordinate across the DOE, including the NNSA, now the NNSA, you know, does not have an energy mission, but I think everyone recognizes they have um, a lot of capabilities and expertise that can and should be brought to bear to to help with the energy mission. So I think it's 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 really a matter of respecting the mission spaces of each of the DOE organizations and their labs, uh, but working together, right, to. to um, uh, to mutually um, advance each other's missions. And that, and that's what we're trying to do through uh, our DOE-wide um, coordination efforts. And I think in the longer term, um, you know, this is a higher level policy question um, that I think DOE or, or even at the interagency level um, that, that could be addressed, you know, a little bit more directly. And, and, I, and maybe, uh, I don't know if JP wants to, wants to add anything to that. I, Scott, I think I think you're articulate well. I think the um, you know the, the 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 question is, of course, um, not just one of of mission, but also against mindset for our scientists in in terms of the work and how we do it. And I think ultimately, it's all of us understanding that it's going to take everybody's effort to coordinate and and really engage and collaborate in a way that helps us get fusion moving forward. The engagement with industry is very important. Our mission ultimately is to enable energy systems and energy transition. Fusion is one solution to that effect. And for all of us to be able to buy into that vision is really important. Hey, another question for you, actually, um, JP or Scott. Um, UK has been able to unify resources to to deploy initiatives and support asset and workforce development under a single stream. With our disparate stakeholders ranging from DOD, DOE, NSF, and others, what is our plan to unify efforts and resources to center on principles of the emerging energy justice practices and also principles here at home and in the global south? JP, do you wanna take that first with your workforce pathways uh, uh, yeah. idea? Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can yeah. start there. Um, so first of all, you know, we we are engaging other agencies right now in terms of both from uh, an initiative perspective and, you know, a dialogue around fusion energy. Um, an example is the workshop on workforce with NSF. There was a lot of our performers that engaged with the NSF on the topic of uh, fusion energy and technology. Uh, we're going to have further discussions with other agencies, including NSF, about the topic. Um, you know, for us, it's really to try to define and, and shape that program in a way that does, again, uh, leverage partnerships across the agency. And that's where, you know, having Scott help us coordinate that effort is really, really key. But I think also not just with, you know, of course, across agencies, but across, you know, equivalent agencies across in, in, internationally. So we're we're discussing these uh, aspects with, you know, our equivalent agency, for example, in the UK, 
around workforce uh, development opportunities. So around the discussions we have, for example, in our US-UK partnerships on technology and science and technology gaps, we also have discussions and conversations about how to address workforce and what can we do to uh, be able to leverage resources to support that. Yeah, I, I might just add, you know, JP, of course, is working on um, realigning uh, the FES program as well as the budget structure. And, and I think going forward, uh, hopefully there will be more natural uh, ways to, um, you know, to fund exactly what the question is getting at. And I'll, I'll, I'll just also add that the Energy Justice and Equity uh, Office in the Department of Energy is, is part of our uh, core, DOE-wide coordination. And of course, they bring their expertise and, and, and network uh, to addressing this issue. And, and we're working to embed these considerations, right, in all the public-private partnership programs like the Milestone Program. Um, all the awardees of the Milestone Program um, will be engaging with their communities and, and in uh, developing uh, workforce, especially with a local perspective. Okay, hey, Scott, you mentioned export controls as a constraint on international collaboration. Can we look forward to some bilateral or multilateral agreements to enable simpler internal um, collaborations and novel fusion technologies? And the, the you know, person that asked the question also wanted to acknowledge the vital role of international collaboration that really enabled um, you know, companies or, or institutions to reach 100 million degree plasma temperature. And, and specifically, this is from um, Tokamak Energy. Yeah, great. Um, uh, in, indeed, export controls is an area we're addressing. Uh, in fact, uh, very, very specifically and actively as part of the U.S.-U.K. Um, uh, partnership, um, where where we've had a couple of meetings already uh, on that, uh, not just on export control, but on our broad partnership. Um, so I would say a couple things. You know, for, first. It's a complicated topic, and also there's kind of two phases of of the topic that we should be considering. One is more near term, uh, even up through demonstration phase of fusion, and one might argue that the present export control regimes are are adequate to address uh, that phase. Um, uh, there are processes um, for. Uh, you know, countries to work with each other and to export uh, hardware and knowledge um, uh, under the present framework. Then there's the question of when we reach the phase of deployment and especially global deployment. And that that's an open question. I think at the U.S. interagency level, we realize uh, this is an open question. And I think at, the U.S. has to uh, further these conversations and arrive at, um, I think, the a right policy uh, for that, especially for that second phase. So this is an active conversation. You know, I think it needs uh, disc broad discourse. And I think um, I welcome uh, continued conversations around this. Fortunately, we have a little bit of time on this, but but we do need to provide the industry uh, some certainty on how this is going to move forward. Thank you. And I'm going to invite all the panelists to answer um, a few questions that we have. Um, that just kind of came up during the discussion that we didn't have a chance to answer. Um, so this is for Andrew. You once said that fusion energy will be available to everyone everywhere. How will it be done in small and underdeveloped countries? Well, thanks, Steffi. And, you know, I wanted to, to actually kind of partner this with, there's a couple other questions about Go for it. the Caribbean, how to partner with the Caribbean, or I'm a student in Egypt and, you know, basically, or African countries. Um, a, the way we look at this, um, of course, you know, fusion is at this point, most of the fusion infrastructure, most of the fusion expertise is in the developed country, largely developed country West. Uh, and um, that doesn't mean that that's where it's always going to be or even where it should be. Uh, the truth is, is that fusion only works as a commercial industry if this is truly global. Um, so that's why it's important what Scott just said about export controls, because, you know, fusion only works to, you know, restart American industry or British industry or European industry uh, or wherever else if uh, they can export around the world. Because if you look at projections for where energy growth is, energy development is, it ain't in our countries. 
it's in the developing world. It's in, you know, Africa, it's in the Middle East, it's in developing uh, country Asia. The, these, these places are where we need to go to find those business opportunities and also to find the, the, the ways to actually solve the problems of climate change, energy security, uh, and, and energy access. You know, there's still a billion people in the world who don't have access to electricity. So we have to find ways to get these all together. So kind of the, the big picture question about how do you get this to everybody? Well, we make it into an export industry. Um, we make it into something just like the global auto industry where, you know, cars are not always cheap, but they are available anywhere in the world. Uh, and there's different types of cars available in different places all around the world. And, you know, some are manufactured in some places and, and you find different markets and, and such like that. The other that so that's kind of the long term, you know, how do we make this available to everybody? But but also in the near term and, even, and medium term, um, we need to bring these uh, the people living in these countries, the governments, the institutions, the universities uh, together to, to get involved in this as well. And, and I'll give an example here of there's this new Arab fusion initiative that the FIA has has partnered with. Um, it was announced a couple uh, 18 months ago or so in an event uh, hosted by a university in Jordan. And now it's it's moving forward with a um, a pathway towards engaging all of the major universities in the region, finding uh, cross-national collaboration in the Arab world, really a place that hasn't done much in fusion before, but now has expressed an interest. I could see, you know, similar efforts um, that could help catalyze a new area in, you know, say, Caribbean and Central America, where there has been some work in the past, but, you know, likely it is underdeveloped and, and needs needs efforts. So, you know, I, FIA is happy to help support these, happy to help place these and, and catalyze these and, and, and everything. And we can't just think that this is only the leading countries in fusion right now are the only ones that matter. So, so I think there's there's a really good opportunity to to push this forward, and you know, and then in the long term, you turn it into a big export oriented industry that has access to all of the development finance needs, has access to all of the the ways that you know major industries are able to export to you know places like uh, Africa, India, um, you know, Latin America, and you know really really push it forward. So we think there's a, there's a real pathway here and we're looking forward to engaging with with all the new new countries and and new excitement on this. And if I could Steffi, maybe just add to Andrew's points that there were excellent points. I think the other part is scale. I think to the extent that we can innovate to be able to really take the technology that we're developing in the next decade and then be able to scale, to me, that's going to be another element mm -hmm. in terms of its adoption across the world. That it's not just the technology for those that have, but technology for those that in fact can uh, be able to get to a point to afford uh, the adoption of that technology. And that will take innovation. That will take a lot of effort on our part to enable us to, again, bridge that innovation engine uh, in the private sector to be able to get that technology uh, everywhere, which is what we want to see. So you talk about deploying, uh, the great answers on deploying it more globally. And there's been several surveys uh, in certain regions in the, in the US and also um, internationally that kind of did public surveys of fusion and what they found was not very many people know about fusion. Um, so, uh, and, and what they do know, they are generally supportive. So what are some of the pathways to build public engagement and also foster trust in fusion? I think it's events, it, you know, honestly, the, the way that, that you get people excited about fusion is to show progress. The, uh, the, the marked increase in uh, interest and awareness of fusion 
after the 2022 uh, National Ignition Facility announcement was very significant. You can see it in all of the Google Trends analysis, you know, search engine optimization, all that sort of stuff. Back end of our website, I can tell you there was a huge increase of, of interest that came and it's been sustained at a higher level. Uh, and so I think it's just, there will be more events like that in Fusion, continuing to have those. And then also it's important that it's communicated at the appropriate level as well. The, the big thing about you know the, the NIF announcement was that it was senior policymakers uh, making a big deal about it. And then the media following that with uh, the media making a big deal about it because it was a big deal. Uh, so, you know, there, there's uh, when we see things like that, we have to we have to highlight them and use them as a moment for education. I, I can chime in, too, on that. Um, and I totally agree with Andrew. I think there's nothing that generates excitement more than major technical advances, as we saw with the with the NIF result. Um, but I, I think, you know, we we are very fortunate that people are excited about fusion and, and in general. Right. At, even though general public doesn't know a lot about fusion that the views are generally positive i think that's a great thing um i think we want to be very uh, careful in, in continuing to earn the public trust uh, with fusion i think there's an opportunity uh for fusion to learn you know from the experiences uh and the successes and failures and best practices of other uh, industries uh it's very important i really love what seth hadel uh, said at the first bold decadal vision which is that fusion has a unique opportunity to differentiate itself not only in the way it uses physics but in the way it engages uh the public uh from the outset and and i think from uh, our perch uh, within the doe we're very supportive of that of um of supporting the industry and the other fusion stakeholders to engage in uh honest two-way engagement where public concerns are, are actually understood and addressed um and so uh, i think it's important for us to do that and, and maintain the public trust yeah i think you bring up a really good point about right now fusion's at the most flexible design point so you can actually think about it very carefully how you're impacting communities and incorporate that into the design deployment or development and, de and deployment. And so I've been working with some of my colleagues um, for, at UW-Madison, also University of Michigan, Arizona State University. Um, and then also we had a, one of our colleagues from the Coast Guard Academy join us on doing these open frame dialogue discussions. And these are like eight hour long um, focus groups where we're really centering the concerns and hopes for fusion of community members and we're going into communities to really understand um, what they're thinking and, and how they're approaching um, fusion and really uh, <clears throat> speaks to that building trust and transparency through these meaningful two-way engagements. And one of the quotes we got from at the end of our, um, our eight hours together was someone said, I wish more researchers could do events like this to help the general public more learn more about their work. I'm sure there's so many more interesting things being studied. Um, so that was a, a really great uh, testament to, to these approaches that you're talking about. I'm gonna go to one of the questions in the chat is currently the four FES strategic goals focus on plasmas. Um, uh, Scott, you mentioned pivoting away from a focus on plasma science to broader topics. Can you estimate what fraction of focus is being applied to plasmas now and where you see it evolving towards uh, in support of commercial industry? Do you see a change in the strategic goals? Well, I think I'll let JP answer that first. I think that was uh, more of an FES program yeah, question. I think, um, okay. yeah, I'm not sure which four strategic goals. I mean, our focus has been to, um, to really emphasize the long range plan scientific drivers, which are basically driving the, the structure of our vision, which is really focusing on, uh, on the three, sustaining a, a, a burning plasma, you know, engineering for extreme conditions and then harnessing uh, fusion power. And all of those are very uh, much a part of the roadmap that we're building and how we're beginning to pivot these programs. In terms of percentages, I can't get into numbers right now, but I think it's important to recognize that you know we just uh, released 
uh, uh, a pretty bold program in the fire collaboratives. The milestone program is basically a sister program to that. And the point is to be able to ensure that that's a footprint in the program to be able then to um, have uh, the rest of the program be able to, to sort of bridge a lot of our foundational work there. Um, and again, as we mentioned at the offset of this, uh, this webinar, there are still science and technology gaps that we have to address. And as Andrew pointed out, the industry understands this. The, the challenge is we need to bridge how we're in fact focusing on those gaps and working together to harness those investments to make sure we get traction on them. That's really the focus of why we need a roadmap to make sure it has metrics, that we're measuring this on an annual basis and that we're making uh, you know, true uh, uh, emphasis on that bridge over to, to uh, industry development. So we're just getting started. And I think that uh, it's important for us to keep that dialogue going. I would also just add from the wider DOE perspective is that um, the pillar two, of course, is addressing uh, commercialization challenges beyond the, the R&D uh, aspects. Um, and that's an area we, you know, are, are coordinating within the DOE, but we're also reaching out beyond the DOE to, to really build the broader support uh, that will be needed, you know, to grow the funding uh, support in those areas. And of course, we're very much looking at public-private partnerships uh, across the board there to, to accelerate things. Yeah, I would encourage those that are uh, hearing this to, to look at our U.S. fusion strategy and building bridges documents that Scott mentioned earlier in his overview. Those are good documents and 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 they're the most recent documents that are really driving how we're thinking about uh, the direction. This is just the beginning, right? We'll be releasing more specifics as we go over time. Question for Andrew. If the key to commercial fusion energy is public-private partnerships, should the taxpayers become shareholders in the U.S. fusion companies in an industry that uh, is valued at $40 trillion, as you said? Well, it's not valued at $40 trillion yet. Um, but <laughs> look, that the, the I saw that question. It, it's uh, an interesting question. Um, that's certainly not the the pathway that any other technology has has trod within the United States before. Um, other countries have different ways of doing uh, tech to market, uh, and other countries are more public ownership focused on this. We do see, for instance, the the UK is planning right now their uh, UKIFs as a right now 100% government owned entity that is going to be the, the delivery vehicle for their step uh, pilot plant. That's just not the American way. That's not how the United States does it. Um, you know, the only the only examples I can think of of the U.S. government taking stakes in industry were um, after the financial crisis in 2008 when they took stakes in the auto companies and the banks. And that was because of a huge failure of industry and failure of, of banks. And basically the whole economy would collapse if they didn't. Uh, it, in, in this case, the United States is not a socialist market economy. Uh, so I don't anticipate this is the way going forward. Well, we only have limited time. So I'm just gonna go and ask all the panelists to leave a couple of thoughts about what, what they're excited about as we go towards this path, towards accelerating commercial fusion. We just got start with JP. I'll just go in order of presenters. Sure. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Steffi. And thanks everybody again for taking time uh, to listen in. Now, I think the last thought is again, you know, we need to converge public and private uh, interest in the best way possible, building bridges between our understanding of where we're at today with, with fusion, with fusion technology. And again, placing the investments, placing the priorities in the areas that we already know are areas that we need to advance and develop. What I'm excited about is the fact that we're having this dialogue, right? That we're having this conversation, that Andrew and I can have that conversation to engage each other and really think about, okay, how do we bridge you know, these aspects together that Scott and I on a daily basis have conversations about how to get to 
realize fusion energy at the international scale. I'm also excited that other countries are really thinking about those bridges with industry. I think this is very encouraging that it's uh, that conversation about fusion at a global level is not only about the science, which is important, but also and very importantly about commercializing fusion energy. Andrew? Yeah, I guess two things. I'm, I'm most excited about uh, the conversations like these show that it is a real partnership. And partnership right now is the model in which we are going forward with commercialization, partnership between government and private sector, international partnerships uh, between governments, um, partnerships, emerging partnerships with NGOs and with communities and, and such like that. And so I think I'm very excited about that. And, and then number two, the, the thing I'm excited about, which we didn't talk too much, is, is techn technical and, and scientific progress. We are building things. This is not just, you know, we're doing it in on a computer screen. Uh, we're, not, we're not just doing it with AI models. We are building things and we are going to show that the fusion future is on its way. So that I, I couldn't be more excited about that. Scott? Yeah, I guess I just want to mention maybe two points. And one is to just emphasize, we, we really are, I think, at this inflection point in, in fusion, you know, from uh, moving from a, what has been a scientific endeavor, a global one, um, to a focus on energy development and, and engineering and applied R&D now, um, you know, with the goal of commercializing fusion. And I think I'm excited uh, that we're in a position to be able to just drive this uh, continued progress in this tr in this transition, and that that's what's really been exciting. I think with the bold decadal vision and what's followed, and then I'll maybe just leave with this idea: is just you know, fusion is not even though we're all excited about fusion as as a really great energy technology and a clean one, abundant. Uh, but it, I think fusion is not just an incremental energy technology. It it will bring untold possibilities and opportunities, you know, for supporting the next stage of humanity and civilization. And that ultimately, that's what really, really excites me. Okay, yeah, I echo all that you have said. I'm really excited as we do this transition, especially someone who's been super focused and almost siloed on, you know, the foundational physics. Now the application just kind of opens your mind and thinks about how you can change the world with this technology. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie, but thank you all for joining us today. Hi everyone, I have a few quick closing remarks. Once again, thank you all for joining us today for our virtual science dialogue on fusion. It's been a huge pleasure hearing from our guest speakers and observing the questions in the Q&A today. Once again, thank you Steffi, Scott, JP, and Andrew for your presentations. And thank you VentureWell, our implementing partner for your cooperation in organizing this event with us. As we close this program, I'd also like to thank all of you for your engagement in this virtual dialogue. We hope this dialogue is a beginning of a creative and productive continuing discussion. And as a reminder, during the registration process, there was an option to share your contact information with the other attendees today. If you did opt to share your information, it will be shared with those who attended in a follow-up email should you wish to continue today's discussion amongst your network and peers. Lastly, we also invite you to participate in a survey about your experience from today's dialogue. The survey will be sent out via email afterwards. Once again, many thanks and have a great rest of your day.